Okay. All right, this one, this little riddle, we have to think about what we're studying right now. Ready? What has two holes, no legs, and runs? No. Ah, oh, nicely done. Is that you that was blowing your nose? Didn't say that? Yeah. See, he was like on the same page. Oh, really? You want me to say it in German? No, no, no. Oh. No, I heard you. I was just asking. Him. French? What type of dance do teachers like best? A ten dance. A ten dance. Yeah, yeah. Question or you're voting for you like that one or okay. all right here we go I think Oliver can get this one what kind of nut doesn't have a shell what type of nut don't shout it out let's let's uh, think about it there's some influential minds in the room what type of nut doesn't have a shell what who who said that a donut nicely done. All right, and we're going to end on that one. But first, before we end, we have a lecture. Okay. All right, so last up, last up is uh, vision. Uh, we're extremely visual creatures. There's no question about that. Um, the world we live in completely leverages our sense of vision. Right? How many of you have a black and white television? One? Really? You do? That's pretty cool. But, you know, black and white TVs have faded because color is just so much better. Right? How many of you have one of those um, TVs that are actually curved? Yeah? Look at that. These have nicer stuff than I do. The curved television. Right? You don't have any, what is it, so you don't have any dull spots, or like, you see it from different angles, or, or what? I mean, the salesperson didn't, didn't try to, you just knew you wanted to curve, you're like, I want to curve, bad boy, so, so everything is, is very visually focused, right, in our world. Um, you know, we have binocular vision, so we actually get information coming from both eyes, and the right eye, half of that information goes and crosses over to the left brain, and the other half of that information goes to the right lobe, or the right brain. And then we sort of cooperate that information and by having two different perspectives, right? So you can, you can determine this by just kind of holding your finger out, hold your finger out in front of you, okay? And uh, go ahead and look at it. Um, you should see one finger. If you're seeing two, you're not focusing on it. And then close one eye and look at it and see where, it positioned, where it's positioned. And then close the other eye. And if you use a benchmark point behind your finger, you'll see your point of view on that finger shift. Right? It tells you that you're getting two completely different images. Right? Now the eye... Here's how you determine eye dominance. The eye that actually doesn't change the perspective when you, close, when you close your eye, that's your dominant eye. So that's the eye that's telling the most information to your brain, right? And, and so many of you that are right-handed, your right eye is your dominant eye, but not always. Many of you that are left-handed, your left eye is going to be your dominant eye, but again, not always. And where that becomes important is, um, you know, for life skills like being able to shoot a gun, right? So if you've ever gone, if you've ever gone, uh, shoot, shoot, shot anything of significance, like a bow and arrow, or even, you know, if you've uh, tried to take aim with a rubber band gun, okay, your dominant eye is the one that you want to take aim with, because it's actually giving you the real perspective of what you're seeing. And that dominant eye, your brain is saying, that's the information that's most key. And the other one is giving you information about three dimensions. And that's what it does. Okay? If we only had one eye, we would have no depth perception. It's that two binocular 
vision that gives us that other perspective that we interpret as the z-axis or that depth where things are. Right? So the other thing is, if you close your eye, one eye, and you try to grab something in front of you, it's a little bit more complicated to figure out exactly where it is without having both eyes open. Your water bottle or your pencil that's sitting on your, on your desk. So, vision is very key to life. This happens to be our last lecture. It's our last special sense. Um, and it's, it's kind of a really impressive one. The way that it's organized. If we look at the external anatomy of the eye, much of this should be very familiar to you, right? We looked at this in laboratory as well, and we've got some information here that's pretty obvious, like, you know, we've got this lacrimal gland that's located on the lateral superior aspect of the eye, so up here. And this produces tears. And the tears enter the eye from the lateral superior aspect, and every blink squeezes out a tear out of the lacrimal gland, drops it into the mucosal layer of the eye, and it flushes from lateral to medial, and clears away the eye and moistens it. And it drains on the medial aspect, uh, into this lacrimal punctum, down this lacrimal canal, and into the nasal lacrimal duct. And that nasal lacrimal duct drains into the nose. So if you, when you cry, I know, I know that it's only the guys in the room have never experienced this, but you've watched it on television. Um, you've seen people cry, okay? So when you cry, you get a runny nose, and it's because those tears have to go somewhere. Right? So the um, lateral and the medial commissures, the lateral and medial commissures are these aspects that are where the two eyelids come together. A commissure is kind of like a connection point between the two um, eyelids, or what we call as palpebrae. The conjunctiva of the eye is the tissue that makes up the eye. It covers the eyelid and the outside of the eyeball. And the mucus that's being secreted by the conjunctiva actually also helps to keep the eye from drying out. Now, incidentally, we would talk about these kinds of things in pathology, but we'll talk a little bit about it here. Patients who suffer from a stroke, um, it may be a unilateral stroke, and so one aspect of the face is actually affected, and if it's a facial nerve that's affected, then that side of the face may be a little droopy. The other thing is that eye may not be able to close or blink. It may stay chronically open because you've lost motor function. In that situation, it's very common for the eye, the vision, to be compromised as the eye continues to dry out all day long. The lacrimal apparatus um, consists of both the lacrimal gland as well as the lacrimal canal. So the lacrimal gland here, as well as the lacrimal canal. This is the lacrimal apparatus. Again, every time you blink, you have a tear that crosses over that's full of not just fluid, um, saline fluid, but it's also full of many different types of enzymes. And those enzymes actually help to combat many of the bacteria that you will bring into the eye because it's a moist, mucous environment. So it's flu season. And one of the best, there's two practices that are really, really important in order to keep ourselves healthy. Number one is washing our hands, right? In our washing of our hands, we really should wash with warm, soapy water for about a 20-second count. That's equivalent to the happy birthday song twice, okay, at normal pace. Now, like, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. <laughs> So yeah, my kids do. I'm like, yeah, I got through it five times, Dad. Like, well, it's not a race, okay? Um, next time counts to 20 seconds. Like, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, ten. It's like, that's not a second. Right. So number one is washing your hands. Number two is don't rub your eyes. It's one of the best ways to actually bring bacteria or a virus into your body. Is to actually, and it's hard. At the end of the day, you're like, oh, man, right? Why does it feel so, I don't know the answer to this question. I don't get it. Why does it feel so good to rub your eyes? I don't know. Okay? I, don't, I don't have an answer for it. 
Okay? There's some nerve to the limbic system, pleasure center, and it's like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But if you wear contacts, you should definitely wash your hands before you do your contacts in and out. Okay? Um, rubbing your eyes is one of the best ways to actually contract some sort of um, infectious agent from their environment. Was there a question over here? Old age, yeah. That's the answer for everything. <laughs> Don't get old, man. It sucks. No, I'm sorry. What? How do you get bags under your eyes? Yeah. Of tears? Yeah. <laughs> Accumulation of bad exams? So the, the, the bags under the eye is tissue edema. It's tissue edema. So it's fluid that's building up under the eyelid within the... The tissue, not part of the eye, it's in actually the, the skin, the dermal tissue. And um, uh, with stress or lack of sleep, uh, what happens is, you know, when you become more hypertensive, <clears throat> you're going to have high blood pressure, right? So higher blood pressure within the vasculature, all of the uh, capillary elements that perfuse the face uh, are very sensitive to that. And so as they become more leaky with higher pressures, you'll get a lot of fluid buildup in sort of these locations that are in natural recesses. Because there, there's, if you, if you don't put your finger in your eye, but if you kind of feel, you can feel the socket right here. Can you guys feel the socket? You can do this without popping your eyeball out, don't worry, okay? I'm like, ah! You know? But if you feel, you can feel that socket. So there's a natural recess right there where actually it's almost as if the tissue is now hanging off of a ledge. And so it creates a natural sac-like structure within the tissue itself, and that's where the fluid were preferentially pooled. So you know, how come you don't get like these bags right here? Because there's no actual recess like anywhere else on the face. Okay. Yeah? Is there any kind of evidence to show that like the less, or the more you expose yourself to like bacteria, the more antibodies you, and immunities you make, so therefore you're actually like benefiting yourself? Yeah, so that's why I always have my children use dirty dishes, <laughs> and I sprinkle dirt from the backyard on their, on their dinner, you know? so Instead of like salt and peppers, like, here you go, here's some immunology right here, baby. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, is there any evidence that um, repeat exposure to bacteria or viruses builds your immune system? Yeah, there is, right? There, and that's the, whole, that's the whole basis of inoculations. Right? That's what immunology is all about. Is you get exposed to the virus and now you build up an immunity to it. It's the whole reason the flu shot works. So there is tons of evidence that suggests that that's not necessarily, uh, that that's, just, that's absolutely true. But um, uh, it still doesn't, I think, justify or warrant, you know, well, maybe we shouldn't, we shouldn't wash our hands and we should rub our eyes all day long. Uh, it's a matter of uh, percentage. Right? So, I mean, you're, you're seeing and you're experiencing or being exposed to harmful bacteria and agents all day long. And when the body itself is fatigued or worn out or tired, and the number of hits, com you know, competitive threats that actually show up, it's just a percentage, it's a matter of time before one will get through your defense mechanisms and become sick. So our natural <coughs> combat of that is, is prophylactic, right? Try to prevent, try to prevent um, numbers from getting in so that you minimize the percent chance of actually becoming infected. Okay, so all of that off of this slide. That's fantastic. Let's look at the internal parts of the eye. Okay, the internal parts of the eye. Um, this is a cross section. So you can see the eyebrow right here, and this we're slicing kind of in this picture, this cartoon drawing through the mid part of the eye. And what we see is we actually see a component of the frontal bone. Here, and we see a component right here of what bone is this? Point. That's the maxilla, right? So this is the maxilla and this is the frontal bone. And, and together they make up the superior and inferior aspect of the eye orbit. Um, you can see some other um, uh, familiar structures like the cornea right here, which is the clear front component of the eye that the light's going to pass through. And it does a tremendous amount of refracting of light. We'll talk about that. You can see the eyelashes here. Um, you can see we've got two um, main apparatus. 
We have what we call the optical apparatus, which is the optics, like much like a camera, okay, much like a telescope, much like that microscope. There are optics that are built in into our eye that move light in different ways. So the cornea would be part of the optical apparatus. The lens, um, the papillary muscles, the different chambers, the fluid, the humor, the fluid that occupies the anterior chamber as well as the posterior chamber. These are all components of the optical apparatus. The neural apparatus is in the back, and the neural apparatus is actually what um, composes or is made up of the retina and the optic nerve. Now, the eye itself, um, with these apparatuses or apparati, um, have within them tunics. Tunics is a word for coat or a layer. And so, if we look at the different layers, we're going to see three. We see uh, organization of the fibrosa tunic, which is the sclera and the cornea. The sclera is the white of the eye, and the cornea is a break in the white part of the eye that sits right in front of where the opening for the light is to come through. The vasculosa, the tunica vasculosa, also known as the tunica uvea, is made up of the choroid, the ciliary body, and the iris. The choroid is pigmented, has um, much uh, large composition of blood vessels, and is located um, behind the retina. The ciliary body is um, found right here. Ciliary body actually um, has muscles that control the lens and the shape of the lens, helping you focus. The iris, the iris is the colored part of your eye, whether it's brown or green or blue, right? And the iris itself uh, is, is um, adjustable in size, which is going to allow for the opening, which is the pupil, to get larger or smaller and allow less or more light in. And then last but not least is our tunica interna, which is composed of the retina. Okay? So these are our different layers. If we go back and we talk about our optical apparatus, this is actually a fairly cool picture. Scanning electron micrograph showing the lens right here. And you can see these suspensory ligaments that are drawn in this diagram has these sort of white strings. The suspensory ligaments actually connect to the ciliary body, which is made up of the ciliary process uh, and the ciliary muscle. And that's what actually helps to control its size. The um, uh, cornea is a clear structure, as you can see on the front right here. It's avascular. So you wouldn't want it to actually have blood vessels in it because you wouldn't be able to pass light through it. The um, aqueous humor, the aqueous humor is actually manufactured by the ciliary body. It makes this serous fluid, and that fluid is released and actually is moved into um, the posterior chamber. Um, it moves from the posterior to the anterior chamber and vice versa through the pupil. And this fluid is actually going to drain. It's actually going to drain within this chamber as well. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about glaucoma. The, um, the lens we talked about, these suspensatory ligaments, well, we can induce a contraction event. And if you contract and increase the tension, then the ligaments are going to cause the lens to do what? If you pull on these, what do you think the lens does? It, it flattens, is the term that I'm looking for. It flattens out. Okay? And then if you relax these suspensatory ligaments, then the lens will actually become more oval-like. And as the light passes through a flatter lens versus a more oval lens, you're going to adjust the focus of the image. Okay? Now, this optical apparatus is quite interesting because 
It's very much like this room. Pretend that this room were sitting in the eye. Okay? The back of the eye is where the screen is. And that's synonymous with the retina. And the images coming from up there where Patty is, let's pretend that that little cutout, if you turn around, you can see that little cutout, that's the pupil. So the white, the yellow part of the wall would be the inside view, right, of the iris. And the hole, which is, which is a rectangular box, is the window that Patty's sitting in. That's where our image is coming from. And it's focusing on this screen, right? And right where that um, glass is, if it wasn't clear, let's pretend that it could actually change shape. That's what happens with the projector, right? You know that we can take the projector and we can adjust the focus. You guys have all seen that. Well, the other thing that we could do is we could actually take this screen and we can move the screen forward like six feet. And what do you think is going to happen to the image? Okay? If we move the screen forward six feet. It's going to get larger, but is it going to be in focus on the screen? Probably not. Likewise, if we took this screen and we were able to move it back into the wall six feet, right, it would also come out of focus. So we're going to talk about how this works, because that's what corrective lenses do. When the shape of this room or the shape of your eye is a little abnormal, then the image doesn't focus exactly on the screen or the retina. Okay? And that's why you need corrective lenses. So it's important for this room to stay filled up or the eyeball to maintain its shape. So we have a fluid medium, a gelatinous fluid medium. That's the vitreous body. And that's the transparent fluid that's back here behind the lens that kind of keeps the eyeball inflated. If you did those dissections in laboratory, you know exactly what that vitreous body, that jelly-like solution feels like. Okay? Now, the neural apparatus. We'll, we'll come back to the, the analogy of the room uh, in a little bit. But the neural apparatus, the retina and the optic nerve. Now, the retina is this screen that I was telling you about. This is an outgrowth of the brain. So you're literally putting an image and forecasting, you're projecting it onto the brain when you see things. That light image is actually shining on your brain. Because the retina is a component of the brain which from development was the telencephalon. The vitreous body, that jelly fluid, pushes that retina up against the back of the eyeball. It keeps it sort of inflated so that the screen is actually exactly where it's supposed to be. Um, this is a picture of, of the retina, like you would see at the eye doctor. And what they're looking for is, there, this is a healthy eye, but you see this vascular tree, this vascular pattern looks like um, roots, it looks like tree roots. Well, over time, if there's any abnormal growth of these blood vessels, and this is why you want to see the eye doctor every couple of years so they can actually get a picture of your eye. Because they would be able to catch early development of more branching or increasing uh, vascular growth in the back of the eye. And if you get too much of it, it actually could go blind. Okay? So they'll look at retinal health. This is a, um, a cartoon drawing of the top picture. And it's showing you that these vascular elements are made up of arterioles that are conveniently shaded in red and venules, which are in blue. But you can see in the real picture, you can't necessarily discriminate them. You can if you actually kind of know the differences um, uh, in the location. So your ophthalmologist will be able to tell you the differences just by this picture. But here we have this cheated diagram where it's already labeled for us. You can see right here in this sort of center point where all of these structures come in and out of is what we call the optic disc. You know, the optic disc is that component in the back of the eye where the, uh, it's the entry and the exit of the blood vessels and the nerve fibers. You can see here as well that we've got what we call our fovea centralis, which is this spot right here. This is a word that translates literally to um, focus central, or the center of focus, the uh, fovea centralis. The fovea centralis has a, a very high density of cones. Cones 
are the photoreceptors that are um, used for visual acuity, sharpness of an image. They also give us information about color. So C, cone for color, and they give you visual acuity as well. Sharp pictures that you see in bright light. The uh, macula lutea, right here, is um, a structure that has uh, a high organization of sensory cells to give you some internal feedback about what's happening at the retina. The um, pupil itself controls the amount of um, light that comes in. So, you know, you can do this experiment home where, you know, you, you close your eyes and you look at your uh, roommate, they have them open their eye in bright light and you'll see the pupil go, right? So, the pupils themselves can control the amount of light that's actually going to come in. The pupil, uh, pupillary constrictors are circular smooth muscle that are in a round like structure oriented. And you have pupillary dilators, which are like wheels of a spoke. Okay? So they radiate out. The change in size happens when you increase or decrease light intensity. So that's what goes in this particular blank. Is this happens when light intensity goes up or when light intensity goes down. Now, if we take a look at this picture, um, you can see in this situation we've got relaxed ciliary muscles. And the relaxed ciliary muscles um, uh, allow for the suspensory ligaments to be tight. If they're tight, you thin out the lens. Down here, it's just the opposite. If you contract the ciliary muscles, then you relax the ligament and the lens thickens. Okay? This is considered uh, for a far vision situation, and this is for near vision situation. So I'm walking through it because the way the lens changes is a little counterintuitive to what the result is. It almost appears to be opposite, the way that it's structured. So if you go back and think about the skin, if the muscle here contract, or sorry, is relaxed, then the ligaments are tight. Usually you think it's the other way around. If the ligaments are tight, then the lens thins and actually flattens. If you contract the muscle, you see how this muscle is contracted and it's bunched up? As it bunches up, the muscle itself, here it's, it's stretched out, the muscle itself is bunched up. You see this little bag of muscle? That causes relaxation of the ligaments. The mu muscle contracting and thickening pushes the gets the muscle closer to the lens, and so the ligaments have slack. You with me? If the ligaments have slack and they're relaxed, then the lens is going to thicken. And this is, you have a thicker lens when you need to see, see things close up. So like right here. For reading, your lens is actually very, very thick. When you're reading your notes, your lens is thick, your suspensory ligaments are relaxed, and the muscle itself is contracted. Likewise, if you want to look at something in the back of the room, you want to thin out the lens. In order to do that, you want to tighten up the ligament so you relax the ciliary muscles. Okay? So, a lot of individuals that study a lot, that have perfect vision, end up exercising these muscles many, many hours throughout the day, right? So you're reading, you're reading, you're studying, you're studying. Your muscles are are contracting in order to allow you to thicken the lens. And if you, if, you, if you do that for many, many years, like say for example college, okay, it's not uncommon for now your far side, your vision far away to start becoming problematic. It's hard when you go from here to look away for you to completely relax your muscles and to tighten up these ligaments to actually thin out the lens. So that's a very, very common scenario for individuals that have a very vigorous study plan in college, have perfect vision going in, and now they've got to wear glasses to drive or to see things far away. Okay? But they can read just fine. That's what happened to me. I can read just fine, but I have to wear glasses to actually see, or contacts to see far away stuff. So does that mean like uh, bird watching would be a form of exercise that would 
Well, the problem with bird watching, okay, is you're usually using optics, right? Because you're using binocs to actually magnify the view. So you're truly not looking far away. You're still actually looking close up. So the same thing happens with like a lot of lab work. So my college experience was studying and a lot of microscopy. So everything was up like this. Yeah. Question over here? Uh, but it was okay. just like, is that, this can explain why you read for a really long time, why it gets Yeah, yeah, exactly. So going back to the, you know, why does it feel so good to rub your eyes? If you're studying, 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 and your eyes are getting tired, that's actually a real statement. Like, my eyes are tired. Like, yeah. Could it lead to headaches? Of course. Is it bad for your health? Absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Keller said studying is bad for our health. All right, so what does the lens do? What does the lens do? Well, the lens actually reflect, refracts the light. Okay? It's the bending of light rays. And light is going to bend any time it passes from one media to another. How many of you uh, grew up in Phoenix and had a swimming pool when you were a kid? How many of you have swam in a swimming pool or seen one on television? Okay, there you go. <laughs> so you know those, um, the, the pool brush? Have you ever stood on the edge of the pool, you put the brush in and it goes what? like this. It's like bent. Yeah. Right? You're like, what in the world? Hopefully you figured out that it's not really bent by now. But as a little kid, I remember thinking, well, that, that is the coolest thing. Mm -hmm. right? You know, I would trick my brothers with it. Right? You put your arm in there like, oh, my God, my arm's broken. And he's like, Bruh. right? So light is refracting at different rates or, or different angles when it passes through air versus when it passes through the water. And that's exactly what happens here is if you look at... The uh, refractive index is what the n value is here. Refractive index is a measurement of how light's going to behave in that particular medium. So, for example, light has a speed of about 300,000 kilometers per second in a vacuum. Well, it's going to be slightly slower in air, and it's going to be slightly slower in water or in glass. And so if you look at air, if air's refractive index is 1, then the um, lens itself has a 1.4 and the cornea has a 1.38. And of course, the aqueous humor, the liquid, is conveniently very close to 1.38, 1.4. So as the light enters the eye, it's coming through three different materials. Right? It comes through the cornea, the aqueous humor, and the lens before it ever makes it to the back of the eye. And, of course, then it sees the vitreous body, but the vitreous body is the same refractive index as the aqueous humor. So it's, it's not really four, it's only three. Well, every time it hits that different media, it actually, this is that pool sweeper analogy, like with that stick, right? Every time it passes through, it's going to bend in a different angle. So the lens actually helps to fine-tune that image, whereas much of the refracting of light happens at the level of the cornea, okay? because that's the first one that it sees, the light sees, or experiences. So the lens does the fine-tuning. Now, if we look at some pr problems that are very common with the lens, we can see them listed here, and many of these are characterized uh, by what some of you all have. So we have presbyopia, hyperopia, myopia, and astigmatism. These are not religions. These are actually conditions <laughs> of the eye. Okay? So presbyopia, this is um, where the lens itself loses flexibility, becomes more stiff, happens with age. Hyperopia, this is farsightedness. The eyeball is too short, so you can't see things close up. Um, <clears throat> hyperopia is this picture right here. This is normal vision, uh, also referred to as ametriopia. This is hyperopia, or farsightedness. Farsightedness is you can't see close up, farsighted, I can only see things far away. And the um, uncorrected circumstance here is this uh, analogy that I used in this room is 
the focal plane of where that image wants to be is behind the eye. So you use a convex corrective lens to bring that image closer in. Okay? The eyeball is too short. In contrast with myopia, myopia is nearsightedness. You can see, see things close up, but you can't see far away. Nearsighted. Sighted near, where you can see stuff close up like reading. The reading in college example that I used. And so in this case, the eyeball would be uh, too long, okay? Or, the other example we used in class is the ciliary muscles are too strong, right? And they become overly developed by too much training. And so the corrective lens is a concave lens, and it brings the image from uh, being too close like in this screen example, the image is focused right here, and we need it to be back on the wall, so you use a concave lens and actually to correct it. Last one, and I'll take your question. An astigmatism. This is where the cornea itself is actually misshapen. Okay, misshapen. You can see sort of the normal cornea here, and you can see how it sort of bulges out a little bit more on this astigmatism. So, the different types of lens conditions. Now, one thing that I want to um, bring up is uh, cataracts, because we're going to talk about glaucoma. And those are the two eye issues that are most prevalent in the older population, and it's the ones that everyone mixes up. So, what, what is going on with cataracts? Any ideas? Any ideas of what's happening with cataracts? Back over here. Um, the cornea is hazing over. The cornea is hazing over? Yeah. Okay. What do you mean by hazing? Um, you can do it you can take it out. Right, you can take it out, agreed. Um, I don't know exactly what it's called though. What, the hazing part? Yeah. What's that? Can they be dissolved? Yeah. So, so cataracts oftentimes are affecting the, um, the protein, okay? The protein itself within the lens, okay? So the lens itself is made up of a protein, and that protein can become denatured over time. So let me use an example that we talked about in one of our first lectures, because this is our, one of our last lecture. Do you guys remember the picture of the raw egg and then the raw egg in a frying pan? And the main component of the white part of the egg is what protein? Albumin. Okay, so albumin uh, in its native form is actually clear. You can see right through it, just like the lens is made up of protein that's actually translucent. As you turn up the heat with that egg and you cook it a raw egg, now the, the clear part becomes white because the protein becomes denatured. And that's the hazing and the cloudiness that you see that happens in the lens. What would cause that? Looking at the sun. Yeah, don't look at the sun. I agree. But just UV light, UV radiation is going to cross-link and denature proteins. And so after 70 years of having sunlight in your eyes, just every day wear and tear, you get this haziness. You're absolutely correct. I just want you to understand what the haziness is. It's the proteins themselves starting to cross-link and become denatured, and they create these little clouds. Okay? And you can go in and you can remove them with laser surgery or cut them out, uh, and it's very effective. Okay? Those are what, that's what cataracts are. Now, if we contrast that with glaucoma, and Dr. Van Hees gave a, a, a great lecture last week, and it's, it's um, published on um, my YouTube site. I recorded it for you. And it's in the folder, the research folder. So it's not in our main, if you go into the main YouTube site, you'll see like four folders for the different classes. There's one folder for the lab, for all the lab lectures. There's a folder for this class. There's one for pathology. There's a fourth folder for research, and it's in that folder. And he talked about glaucoma. And um, I told you that I would tell you what I want you to know about glaucoma. I really want you to be able to understand the differences between um, cataracts and glaucoma because that's what most of your parents or grandparents are going to be experiencing. 
Now, glaucoma is extremely different. Whereas um, cataracts form in the lens, glaucoma is an issue where you've got a buildup of pressure when it's pressure-sensitive glaucoma. You have a buildup of pressure, and it starts causing damage to the optic nerve back here. And this pressure uh, is very similar to a circumstance that we looked at early in the semester with hydrocephalus. Do you guys remember hydrocephalus? Mm -hmm. So glaucoma is kind of like the Western world issue that the rest of the world deals with, with like hydrocephalus. And it's a similar problem, is that the fluid, the aqueous fluid that's being manufactured by the ciliary bodies, actually needs to drain from the eye every day. It needs to drain at the angle of the trabecular meshwork. And so when the fluid is building up and being produced and it doesn't drain, you get an increase in intraocular pressure. And that pressure puts inappropriate pressure on the optic nerve and over time can actually cause blindness. Okay? Make sense? Question? So is it like hydrocephalus or can be caused by the production of the aqueous and like it doesn't drain properly? Yeah, so the question is, is it like hydrocephalus where it could be either overproduction or no draining. It is, theoretically, but in, in our circumstance, it's usually the drain is plugged. The drain gets plugged up over time. Okay? And so some of the solutions are eye drops to actually lower the production of um, fluid and to increase the draining, or um, shunts, like what we saw with hydrocephalus, or now we're doing procedures where we're actually perforating channels extra channels into the back and front of the eye to allow that fluid to drain. Question? There's a question, another one? Yeah. What's the difference between cataract that's like the and when you're older? Like I was born with one. Born with a cataract? Yeah. Um, so it, it, the difference is just it, at the, um, the point in time and when it forms. And so if it formed embryologically, it probably was cross-linked by, you know, some hereditary abnormality. Um, it's, it's probably um, likely, I'm guessing, uh, it's going to have a similar prognosis as cataracts in, in older patients, whereas once they're removed, there's really no big deal. Um, it may be, maybe your doctor tells you you're going to be likely more susceptible to cataracts in the future if you had it when you were very young. So they may tell you, you know, always wear your sunglasses. You want to try to minimize the amount of um, UV radiation. But that's why old people wear those really cool <laughs> sunglasses, right? It's function over style right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In my, I think I heard you. In myopia, another cause of it that we talked about was overly strong ciliary muscles. Can they atrophy over time and self-correct? They usually don't. And the reason for that is um, the eye is developing that entire time. Right? As you put your glasses back on. And so as the eye is developing throughout you know, this phase of your life, uh, when you're done, unfortunately, with college, your eyes will pretty much be done developing, and then they're going to be set. And um, they'll be set that way for a while, and you'll stabilize. And then, um, of course, later in life, you'll have other issues, right? So I just keep checking to see when I'm going to have to have reading glasses, because I'm right in that age group where they say I'm supposed to need reading glasses soon. But, um, you know, I'm bird watching, right? And I'm doing my eye exercises, right? <laughs> Trying to combat those reading glasses, yeah. Why is it that when, it, when you have myopia, it progressively gets worse over time? So um, with myopia, because it's a muscle issue, um, the muscles themselves like to contract. That's what muscles are supposed to do. So it's sort of a positive feedback. As you exercise them and continue to develop them, they're going to kind of continue to um, contract up. And the suspensory ligaments, you have to remember, the other issue that's going on is it's not just muscle, it's also muscle to ligaments. And so as we get older, our ligaments get more floppy. 
right? So the muscle is strong, and as you get older, that ligament is going to become more and more loose. And so even if the muscle was to atrophy, if the ligament loosens out as we age, which it does do, it's going to get progressively worse. Oh, that's, that, so if you're born with it. So these, these situations right here, your, the shape of your eyeball doesn't really change as you. I mean, it might change a little bit. You might have a situation where you see kids that had glasses and they grew out of them, right? What happened? Well, they probably had a, just a slightly different shape when they were a kid. And as they continued to grow, the eyeball itself kind of rounded out and they grew out of their glasses. I know lots of friends that had glasses as a kid. They don't wear them now. But if you have hyper, if you have myopia that you develop later in life, if you have 20-20 vision, so you're born with 20-20 vision, and with myopia, which is more common amongst this population because you're studying, it's likely not a misshapen eyeball. Your eyeball is probably fine. What happens is you exercise those muscles aggressively, and so they become more tight, and as they become more contracted, the ligaments become more loose. Well, as you get older, those ligaments are going to continue to loosen as the aging process continues. So even if the atrophy of the muscle happened, as this question was asked, the, the deterioration of the ligaments will allow it to progress. Okay, last question, then i got to go on. We had, like, hardly any slides, but you guys are super excited about questions today. That's fine. So, for does it decrease the range in which accommodation is or does it Um, it can be both. It can be both with the crest wheel. Okay, so the last part is the physiology. The last part of today's lecture is the physiology. And um, what I want to talk about with the physiology is how it's organized. And what's interesting is here is the direction of the light, and this is the back of the eye. And all of these structures are actually found within the retina. Okay, so this is a cartoon drawing of the retina. And what you should first off see is the light passes all these structures. And what it does is it hits the back of the eye and it's going to trigger these photoreceptors first in the back of the eye. But it already passed through all of these structures. So it passes through all these structures and activates the photoreceptors because these structures, like the bipolar cells, and the ganglion cells are not sensitive to light. So it's like the light goes right through them, they don't even know it. The photoreceptors are the rods and the cones. And they're, they're called that because of their shape. So the rods up here have a rod-like appearance, and the cones have sort of this cone-like head. And again, the cones themselves are responsible for visual acuity and color vision. There's about six and a half million cones that are present in the eye. There's about 130 million rods that are present. And rods give us information about shapes or movement. And rods give us information in monochrome or black and white. So another way of saying this is cones dominate during the daytime when you have lots of light and you can actually appreciate sharpness in the vision. And you can appreciate the full range of the color spectrum within white light that's visible light to us. And then rods are active at nighttime. Okay? They still give you vision information, but the rods give you vision information really in black and white or monochrome, and it's either an off or on signal. Okay? The um, way that these work is this layer of photoreceptors all exist in a similar plane. And the distribution on the retina, if you imagine the retina as sort of like a dish, like a satellite dish, all along that surface is a distribution of rods and cones. Now, the cones are going to be at higher density in the middle of that dish. Remember, they're going to be in high density at the fovea centralis. And as you move out on the periphery of the dish, or the retina, you have less cones, not that they're absent, but fewer, 
and you have more rods. So the way that you can test this is if you, and you can do this great in Flagstaff at night because it's a, it's a dark city and we're really into uh, stargazing and bird watching. <laughs> but there's no real birds you can see at nighttime because there's no light. So you got to look at the stars. So if you are out at night, okay, tonight, tomorrow it'll probably be snowing. So don't do it tomorrow. You got to do it tonight, okay? And um, tomorrow, tonight, when you go outside, if you look up at a star cluster, there's a there's a great app on the uh, iPhone. Do you guys? This this app is so cool. You guys should get this. Okay, I know I'm totally sidetracked, but um, because this lecture is sponsored by Star Tracker, um, thank you to Mountain Dew and Star Tracker. The Star Tracker is this app where it'll you, look, look at this. Do you see my phone? You see it? Like, oh, which one do you calibrate? I don't want to calibrate, dude. Some of us don't have 2020 vision. Some of us don't have 2020. So you can't see this? All right. So watch this. Watch this. See this? You can you can get online and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. See look. See look at that. Okay. How's that? Who needs 2020 vision, dude? We got technology. Okay. So. You go outside tonight, okay, and look up at the stars. I, I, I'm all seriousness. Find a cluster in the sky, okay? And then look at it with your peripheral vision and watch. It'll get brighter. It'll get a little bit brighter. And the reason it gets a little bit brighter when you do that, when you're looking at it and you look a little to the side, but you're still kind of capturing it, it gets brighter is because now that picture is actually stimulating a higher number of rocks, and it gives you a brighter picture. And so if you're walking around in the forest, right, you find yourself, you're, you know, you were locked in the trunk, blindfolded, remember that guy, and you escape, and now you're in the forest, running through the forest, look with your peripheral vision, okay, because it'll be brighter at nighttime with your peripheral vision. So all of these layers of cells actually converge on to a limited number of bipolar cells. Oh, I still got my Star Trek there. Alright, I gotta turn that off, otherwise my battery just goes. They all converge onto a limited number of bipolar cells. See all these? The signals then come down to bipolar cells. Those converge onto ganglion cells. These guys actually form the nerve fibers of the optic nerve. So the light comes and goes through all layers. It goes through the ganglion cells, through the bipolar cells, hits the photoreceptors, and then the signal goes this way. So it comes in, lights up the photoreceptors, and then goes this way, and then goes to the optic nerve. So what's happening with the photoreceptors is really our last topic that we actually need to talk about. The photoreceptors, right, the rods look like this, the cones look like that. Here is a scanning electric micrograph of the two. You can see the rods are definitely taller. And the rods, there's only one, and it it's, contains a protein known as rhodopsin. And rhodopsin has two parts, or two moieties. It has an opsin protein and a retinol. A retinol is in a vitamin A derivative. So you remember, you know, carrots are high in vitamin A, and so there's always, your mom's always telling you to eat carrots, right? All, you should definitely eat carrots, Oliver. It has lots of vitamin A in it, okay? And that helps you develop and build the retinol in your eye helps for visual acuity, okay? The cones, the cones have phytopsin that exists in three different flavors, right? Blue, green, and red. The blue is the short wavelength at about 420 nanometers. The green is the medium wavelength at about 531 nanometers, and the red is the long at 558. Am I going to ask you those numbers on the exam? No. Okay. But what I want you to be able to understand is, and you guys are probably too young to remember these kinds of TVs, okay? But there were these TVs, you go into like a pizza parlor, and there was this projection television in the corner. It's like this big screen TV, right? And it was being projected from the floor, and if you looked inside, right, that's what I would always do, right, is there were three cans. And there was a blue, a red, and a green can. It was firing blue, red, and green. And from blue, red, and green, you would get all the colors on the TV screen, right? The primary colors of blue, red, and green will give you all the different colors when you actually mix them in various forms to see all of visible white light. 
All right, so lastly, what we need to close on is how does it work? How does it work? So we've got two basic formats that these proteins will exist in. This is an example that's showing um, the cis to trans configuration of rhodopsin. Right? Rhodopsin, again, was actually for rods. The cones operate in the same format, and they photobleach in a similar way, one for blue, one for red, and one for green. When blue light hits it, it goes from a cis configuration to a trans. Okay? So here we've got the um, cis retinal formation within the opsin protein that's light sensitive. When light hits it, you see how this is bent? That's the cis conformation. That molecule goes through a conformational change when white light hits it, and it moves into a um, trans-retinal configuration where it's straight. When it does this, it triggers a cascade that breaks down cyclic GMP, guanosine monophosphate. And that guanosine monophosphate sends a signal via an action potential to the optic nerve. It says, I'm seeing light. Okay, when that signal goes away, the um, transretinal is dissociated from the opposite protein, and it's recycled. It's reset into its cis-retinal format, and then it's inserted back into the opposite protein, and it's ready for another stimulation event. Okay, so this explains if... Someone takes your picture with a flash, and there's this big flash of light, and you're like, I'm blind for a second. That's, that is because all, almost all, of the rhodopsin in your eye, right, in the retina, has actually moved from the cis form to the trans form. And it takes you that amount of, you can count them. So you can do this experiment as well with your roommate. You get a stopwatch and a flash. So I just want to do a little experiment on you. Ready? Tell me when you can see again. What? <laughs> what? Wait, what's going on? Can you see it? No, no, no. Now I can. Sweet. Four seconds. Okay? So do it ten times, divide by ten, get the average, and then we'll actually plot the data. Just kidding. But this is how you see, is you have a photoreceptor protein that's sensitive to light that goes from this shape to this shape. This shape to this shape. And as it does this, right, when it does this, it opens up a cascade of events to cause ion fluctuation and action potential. And that action potential converts to an electrical signal to the brain, and then you interpret that as vision. Okay? Questions? That concludes our semester. And uh, yeah, nice job, you guys. I will see you next week in the final.